Amen. Well, welcome to HBF. It is good to see you, and uh, happy Thanksgiving in advance a few days. So it's uh, good to see. If you are a college student coming home, we're glad to see you back. I see, I think I see Mrs. Shipley. Any, any other college uh, adults here? I see, yeah, there we go. We got one in the back. I won't embarrass you too much, but uh, we're just glad to have you guys back with us, and Thanksgiving is a good week. It's a good time to get together with those that we love and remember. We, ha- we said we have another one. Oh, Mr. Bonison, yes, Riley. So he's like, yep, that's me. <clears throat> so uh, I already knew he was back. I got to visit with him the other day, so that's good. It's good to have you guys back with us, and uh, just uh, it's good to have our family together. Uh, and, and so we just really, we welcome you, and I hope when you're away, you know that this is home, and uh, you can always come back and and uh, also listen to our podcast because we got messages for you. So um, Thanksgiving holiday, in addition to being a great time uh, with the relationships that we have, it's also, uh, you know, it's also a time that can be difficult, right, because of separation, because relationships that we had, and it's exceptionally painful if those relationships have been terminated by death and we don't have confidence that loved one is in heaven. And so uh, my condolences to anyone that's lost a loved one, especially anyone who's lost a loved one, without the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's really why we exist. Because uh, just like Matt was talking about faith, faith is substance. Faith is something that is solid, that you can get a hold of, uh, even though you can't see it. And this book of Second Timothy is all about faith. As a matter of fact, this morning, we're going to be talking about faithful, faithful men. And as we look at this passage, we remember that Timothy... Uh, or Paul, I should say, rather, is sitting in his jail cell in Rome, and he's writing to his dearly beloved son, Timothy. And he longed to see his beloved son in the Lord while he was awaiting release from prison. Now, he wasn't going to get out, you know, the standard way, like walk free through the streets of Rome, but he was going to go and uh, meet up with an executioner, and that executioner was going to use those instruments, and those instruments, whatever they used, uh, tradition says, I think it was a guillotine or something, or his head got chopped off with an axe. I'm not, I don't know. I wasn't there. I'll ask, when I get to heaven, I'll ask Paul, how'd you get killed physically anyway? And so the bottom line is, is that Timothy um, was his son, and, and Paul longed to see him. There was that separation. And we had a lot to be thankful for, for, despite the condition, right, that we may be in. Despite all those things that we've talked about with the apostle Paul, uh, he was still training his son in the ministry, he was still preparing him for what lied ahead. And he was also fighting to the finish. He wasn't laying down. He was going out with guns blazing. And he was moving Timothy uh, from a place of fear. Even though Timothy was faithful, he was moving from a place of fear to a place of fearlessness so that he could be fruitful. And so uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 through 2, we saw some teaching um, that, can, that confirms that uh, Timothy is who he needs to be. And that's really what we're looking at this morning in 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're not going to get very far. And so, uh, so uh, we're only going to see verses 1 and 2. And uh, we're going to look at the instructions that he left for him. He taught him who he needed to be so he could do that which God had saved him to do. And he was a faithful young man, yet he still had room to grow. And isn't that the case for all of us? Uh, Timothy was no longer uh, just a son disciple just some young guy who was learning. He was, I would consider him a mature man of God at this point. He was a co-laborer with Paul. He was a right-hand man. So it isn't like, uh, like Timothy's just learning the ropes. And it's not like Timothy has not already suffered uh, with the Apostle Paul and for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's already salty. Uh, but yet, despite that, uh, Paul continues to remind him of his identity in Christ. And he, he reminds him that it's important not to be full of fear. We saw in chapter 1 and verse 7 that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And then he turns that discussion to not being ashamed. Now, therefore, Timothy, be not ashamed, uh, therefore, of the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ, nor of me, his prisoner. And he says to Timothy, I'm not ashamed in verse 12. And he says, look at Onesimus. He, or, I'm sorry, Onesiphorus. He's not ashamed either. And so, Timothy, be not ashamed. And then he goes into chapter 2 and verse 1. Now, therefore, my son, uh, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ. And as you look at this principle, just look at the word of God with me. Our text this morning is verses 1 and 2 of 2 Timothy. 
Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this very practical and very uh, personal and very powerful teaching that you've given us from 2 Timothy. God, we pray this morning as we look at this that we will remember uh, the life that is in Christ Jesus, the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus that you have delivered to us, and Lord, that we would obtain this grace, that we'd be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, that we would uh, not be full of fear, Lord, but that we would have that spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Heavenly Father, we pray this morning that we could obtain these verses, Lord, that you would grant us the grace to be those that would um, that take the things that we have heard, Lord, that we would commit them to faithful men who are able to teach others also, and there would be fruit and much fruit and fruit that remains. We just thank you and we praise you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning as we approach this passage, I'm actually fairly fired up. I have, uh, I've had this whole passage outlined now for quite a while, and uh, God's telling me, Brian, you're going to take this at my pace. So we're going to be camping here. I can't get partly through a verse without uh, today. I, had to, I was like, man, I've got to shut this off. I could preach two or three weeks just on this one verse. So, so I am full. You know, the cup is full this morning. This passage is full. It's rich. It's deep. And I really believe God wants us to focus here for just a while. And I showed you last week, uh, well, actually, it's been two weeks ago. Last week, I showed you a living epistle. That's what we did last week. And uh, I hope you had to spend some time with our friend uh, this last week. It was a great opportunity to, to, to just be refreshed and to be a refreshment. Um, but I showed you the week prior um, how this whole section of chapter 2 lays out. And we, if you remember with me, we talked about how it's so important in our journey from fear uh, to fruitfulness uh, that goes through fearlessness that we find our identification in Christ as a what? What was it, class? Son. Very good. Because it's the big block at the bottom. If you're not a son of God, if you're not a child of God, you're not going to understand the rest of this chapter. The, the, this reality is, is that Paul addresses Timothy as my son. Now, obviously, he wasn't his physical son. He was the son in the Lord. But that's only possible through the gospel. He was begotten of God through the gospel. He shared the gospel with someone, and he came to faith. I had the privilege just last night of opening up the Bible and, and sharing the gospel with someone. And you know what? They came to faith in Christ. And so what are they? They're born again. You become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So Timothy's his son in the Lord. Your identity with the God the Father starts as a son, as a child of God. If you don't understand that, you're going to have a hard time uh, figuring out what it is to do with the rest of the salvation stuff because you're going to have an identity crisis. Because you're, who was your father before? That's right, you discipleship experts. Uh, uh, John chapter 8, your father was the devil. And, uh, and that's what the Bible says. Don't get mad at me. That's what, John, that's what the Bible says. That's what Jesus says. And so <laughs> to religious people who had covenant promise to the law, all right, before he died. So these were people that understood who God was. And Jesus says, hey, by the way, you're of your father, the devil. And, uh, and so when you must be born again. Why? Because otherwise you're, gonna, you're not going to know who your daddy is. And so we started there. We talked about that. And if we understand that, then we can understand what it is to be a steward, a soldier, an athlete, a husbandman, a teacher, a student, a vessel of honor, and a servant, which is the other aspects that we'll see as we go through this chapter. And so those eight illustrations, right, eight's a number of new beginning, they rest on that one, that one of being a son of God. And that reality is this, that's why we bear fruit, because John 15, right, we abide in the vine, uh, they asked me to come to India to preach on church growth. I'm like, why? <laughs> like, like Heartland's overflowing, you know? Uh, no, I don't think, I, I don't know what to tell them. All I got, I'm just going to go, guys, abide in the vine, John 15. That's how you grow, right? Be in Christ. That's the reality. Be a son of God. And then these other fruit, that fruit, there's nine of them in the Bible. Nine is the number of fruit bearing. And I don't think it's any accident that God has laid it out that way. Now, if you were here a couple weeks ago, <coughs> we spent some time and we talked about identification as a faithful son. And in verse 1, we saw that, it's, it's a, uh, that faithful men need examples of, of faithfulness. They need examples. And we talked about an example. So that's sometimes something what you look at, you observe, uh, you pattern yourself after. 
but they also need in samples. And we talked about how God provided that for Timothy, how difficult at times it might be for even Timothy to live up to the shoes of Paul. I mean, that would seem impossible, but he didn't just have Paul. Timothy had men like Onesiphorus, somebody who was probably under him in ministry yet served as an example of faithfulness and fearlessness and a man who ministered to Paul and was not ashamed of his chain. He's like, hey, Timothy, if you, if, if you, I'm not only not ashamed, but neither's a nest of force. You know that guy from Ephesus where you pastored? Yeah, be like him. <laughs> you don't have to be like me. Just be like him. Just do what God called you to do, Timothy. Be faithful. Be faithful. And so we talked about that, and we saw the, the, that faithful men need to be strong in grace that is in Christ Jesus. And I'm reviewing this because we're going to have to go back around and look at this a little bit. <clears throat> we know that there are those in the church that struggle. Paul wrote a whole epistle to the church of Galatia because they got saved by grace through faith and then they wanted to continue uh, in the flesh. And Paul's like, God forbid. How can you do that? You can't, you can't finish in the flesh what God began in the spirit. And so we talked about how grace is such a big topic. I could go on and on for years. But the reality is this. It's not, a, it's not just important that you understand information about grace, which is important. Grace grows. Grace is, comes from God, and, and, uh, and grace is powerful. There's a lot of things we can learn about grace, but the reality is you need grace. And we, and we talked about the way to get grace turned on in your life, right? You may not understand uh, how God delivers it. You may not understand all the power and how God is able to do this work in your life, but the reality is when you need God's grace, it's there. It's powerful. And you need that switch on. And anybody remember, what was the switch that you need to turn on if you want to see God's grace in your life? They're like, Brian, that's two weeks ago. Are you kidding me? Well, I'll help you out, class. Humility. Humility. And so you got to be humble. Uh, Proverbs 3.34 said, Surely he, uh, he scorneth <coughs> the scorners, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. So God says, okay, stop right there, Heartland. Let me just give you an example of grace and my power and humility. And he brings that living epistle in, and we go, oh, okay. Why are those words powerful? Because, well, he's lowly. James 4, 6, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he, God saith, he resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. 1 Peter 5, 5, we saw that. Repeated, likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the, uh, to the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. And so we talked about how grace is like power. Uh, you may not understand exactly how God delivers it, but you do know that when you humble yourself under God's mighty hand, he will definitely bring it. And, uh, and, and he is, it's available, not only for salvation, but for your sanctification and, as Paul is giving it here to Timothy, for your service. We need, we need, he says, Timothy, you've got to be strong in grace because you've got a big job ahead of you. You can't do this in the power of the flesh. The same power that gets you saved is the same power that's going to sustain you until you get to go home. And, beloved, so today in the church, I think that's so important because we've got so many other things we can trust other than Jesus Christ. And, our, and, and so we need to make sure that we're focused on that. Now, that's the end of my review. Now, look back in the text with me. And as you're doing that, be searching for 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a little cough, so you'll have to put up with me. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, we've read this in verse 1. I'll just start. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And I pointed out last week that chapter 1 starts uh, with this introduction about uh, the will of God according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. And then chapter 2 starts uh, with this introduction and in saying, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Right? We get our life through Christ Jesus, the resurrected Lord and Savior, and we get this grace through Christ Jesus. Our source, our source of life, our source of power comes from God. All right. Now, what do we do with that power? Well, verse 2, and the things that God uh, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. There's three aspects of this verse this morning that we're going to look at. But before we do, I want you to look at that verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2. It's a companion verse. When we look at this verse, really this summarizes 
uh, the issue of chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 combined. 1 Corinthians 4 <coughs> and verse, uh, verse 1 says, Let a man so account of us as ministers of Christ. And here it comes, stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, I did a sermon uh, several months ago, and we actually, I listed quickly all seven mysteries as we teach them here at HBF. And if you look in Larkin's book, he'll have 11, but they're all in there, and they're all the same verses. The reality is that we have been given the mystery of the gospel. We have been, and that isn't something that we don't know. That's something we do know. That's something we are to be stewards of. We are to know uh, the mysteries, and we're to be stewards of those. The Apostle Paul is saying to Timothy, the things that you've heard me say among many witnesses, you know what? Those are the things that you need to be holding on to. You need to be listening to, keeping hold of, and then giving to other, other, other faithful men who don't just hang on to them, but then they take them and they give them to other, other, other faithful men who don't just hang on to them, but give them to other faithful men that are what? The qualification is able to teach others also. This is, a, of course, a discipleship model, <coughs> and that's what we are all about here at HBF. Our identity as a son of God will lead us into an understanding of our stewardship. I'll just pause there. Your, your identity, my identity as a son of God, it, it leads me into an understanding of my stewardship. This week I said to our pastor friend from, from Asia, I said, uh, you know, uh, to whom much is given, much is required. And he says, oh, oh, pastor, you say that all the time. I said, I do? He says, yes, you say that all the time. I was like, oh, I didn't know that. Um, I didn't know that. And I thought, I thought about that, especially as I began to prepare this. And I'll tell you why I say that all the time, because of what I just said in, this, in my notes, right? Our... our our understanding of who we are as a child of God, it opens up this understanding of who we are as a steward. Now, I want to unwrap this for you, unpack it uh, for those of you techno people. So, to be saved is to, is to really be a steward. When you receive the gospel, you received eternal life. You're not just saved from hell, but you're saved for heaven, Right? Now, you may not fully grasp that. I know I didn't the day I got saved. I was so glad I was saved from hell. I, I, it took me a few days to get focused on what I was saved for, right? <clears throat> but you're not just saved from hell, though you are, but you're saved for a purpose. Otherwise, God would just take you out of here. You'd vaporize. God leaves you on the earth, and he allows you to, to, to un, un, unfold this understanding of what it is to be a child of God. So you can learn that you are actually, this is what you're going to learn, that you are a steward of the mysteries of God, and you need to be faithful. And some of you take the short trip on that, that class, and you go, oh, get it? Yeah, mom and dad said children obey. That's good. I'm going to do that. And the quicker you learn that, the quicker you can move to the next class, right? And others of you, <laughs> you get stuck in that four while loop, and you just won't obey God, and then you wonder why your life is miserable, but you say, I'm saved. Well, go back to square one and obey the Lord, right? And do that which God has saved you to do. Starting with baptism, starting with being in the church and getting fed, starting with, with being obedient and just submitting yourselves to other people's authority and quit being your own boss, right? Because that's what's going to keep getting you in trouble. Now, uh, but for those that are stewards, they've gotten past that. They understand that, you know, this life isn't about me. It's really about what God's doing through me so that I can help others, because there's a bigger issue, right? What Paul is saying in just two verses, you can see it. He's saying, listen, Timothy, this life ain't about you, bucko. It's not even about the guys that you're reaching, bucko. It's about everybody else that's coming behind you. See, this is a long, extended uh, handoff. It started in the first century, and here we are at HBF, and you're kidding yourself, even though I know it's the last days, and, and I, know that, I know where we are in time. You're, if you're living your life like this is the last generation, then guess what? It might be. But that's not who God saved you to be. Any more than when you start to grow up, you start to realize you got plumbing and wonder, what is all this about? It's so you can reproduce. 
God wants us to reproduce. The more we understand about who we are, the more we recognize, man, God's equipped us as a body, man. He's put people in place. He's put everything in order. Why? So that we can reproduce faithful men who are able to teach others also. I'm getting fired up, guys. I got to get back to my notes. We'll never get out of here. So the life we live in this fleshly tabernacle after that we are saved will impact our standing, check this out now, before the judgment seat of Christ. Yes, it will. And so we are judged for the things done in the body, whether they be good or bad, after we get saved. 2 Corinthians 5.10, you all know the passage. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. I like that all. Lord's Supper's coming up next week, Right? So some of y'all still haven't figured this out. You think, oh man, I'm going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I'm going to be judged for the things I've done in the body, in this physical body. Is that true, class? Yes, it is. Not a trick question. That is true. But you notice he says we're all. You know why the things that you do in this body affects everybody else in this body. That's why we have the Lord's Supper. That's why Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. Too many people were focused on me, 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 and they forgot that they aren't saved for me, me, me. We're saved for we, we, we. Now that could be a joke. Okay, so <laughs> the New Testament is clear that when we are born again, we become heirs of eternal life. Okay, so let's just keep tracking with me here. So you are an heir of eternal life. I was going to throw in Galatians chapter 4, but I, I just didn't have time. You can go look that up on your own. Literally, as a child, you are an heir. So you're not just a servant. You're not going to just work your whole life in the kingdom, and then you're just going to go, hey, see you later, go get a millennial rental, and you'll be done. No, no, that's not our inheritance, man. We are sons of God. Yeah, that's a pretty awesome promise. I mean, we're not just like working for the Lord. We're owning the ranch we're working on. And that's a pretty awesome deal. And so we're heirs. We're heirs of who he is. Now, uh, now in the New Testament, Ephesians 1.3 says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And uh, I, like, I didn't coordinate with Matt, but that hit what he was talking about in Hebrews 11, 1, really works out well with this passage because it is by faith. We are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places uh, in Christ. So we have this incredible... Uh, resource called, uh, called spiritual blessings in heavenly places. We have this grace. That's why Paul says, be strong in the grace, Timothy. And it sounds real good. And it is. It's awesome. Like, hey, 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 man, I got all this. And you do. But you also, once you really believe that and you receive that and you really get your head around that, you have to realize that those resources that God has given you to live require obedience. And a couple of weeks ago, we talked about that humility. We didn't do anything to earn the riches of God, did we? We just trusted and believed and we received. And, and, and they were free for us to employ. As we beseech the Lord by faith, because we now are born again, we're heirs of God's righteousness by faith in Christ. So we have access to those heavenly blessings. Now, now, we are encouraged by the Lord Jesus Christ to recognize that power. And so he's given us this incredible priesthood. Paul already wrote to Timothy about that in Second Timothy or 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're to engage in this prayer, uh, this, this prayer ministry, right? We're gonna, tonight, we're going to come together, we're going to pray and we're going to be specific. Wednesday night, we prayed. I mean, we are engaging in prayer. We got people with cancer. We got people, five deaths, four cancers. I mean, it's time to be praying, right? We see a lot of physical things, but there's just as much spiritual, if not more, action going on at the same time. Why? Well, we are to engage in prayer. Why? Because we know the resources are in heaven, and we call upon the Lord. This is a, this is a priesthood that we've been given as well. That's part of our identity, and so Hebrews 4.14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. I mean, that means hold on tight. Hold on tight to what you profess about Jesus. Hang on tight to that thing. He says, <coughs> he says uh, 
going in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of, you know what that throne is called? Grace. Hey, Timothy, you want to be strong in the Lord? You want to be strong in his grace? Hey, spend some time coming before the throne of grace and attain mercy and grace to help in a time of need. Because listen, there's a time of need. And we need to be calling upon the Lord of all grace. We need to be coming to the throne of grace so we can get the mercy and grace that we need to accomplish God's mission and God's power. Hey, Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Why? Because your life is in Christ Jesus. Your identity is in Christ Jesus. Your power is in Christ Jesus. As Paul sat in his jail cell in Rome, hey, listen, beloved, he was richer than Nero could ever imagine. Nero was the ruler of the world, unlimited power and resource. Yet he was bankrupt. He was an antichrist, literally. Not the antichrist, but an antichrist. He hated Christ. That's why Paul was in jail. That's why 10 Roman persecutions are coming Timothy's way in the church for the next 200, 300 years. Because the devil hates us. Why? Because we are the sons of God. We are super, super, super duper rich. You say, well, we don't look like it. We look like the scourge of the earth. Precisely. <coughs> Paul was exceedingly rich in Christ because he was a son of God. He was rich in the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. And he was calling his beloved son in the Lord, Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And he was asking Timothy not to be ashamed of his chain, but to look past that and avail himself of the wealth of God's goodness and grace. Why? Because he had this great access to God from heaven. Through Christ Jesus, Paul once wrote a letter to the saints of the church of Ephesus where Timothy used to pastor. And he told them in the third chapter that God had given this dispensation of grace, given in this dispensation of grace an ability to understand all mysteries hidden in Christ. And then later in that same chapter, in that letter, he says in verse 7, Wherefore, I was made a minister according to the gift of the Grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. He's telling the church at Ephesus, man, God did a work in me. And we all know the story how Paul was one day going on this road to Damascus and to kill Christians. The next thing you know, he is one. And all of us have some sort of testimony, regardless of whether you were raised in a Christian home and you came to faith in Christ or you were some gnarly, a rotten sinner and God met you in the ditch somewhere and got you saved. It doesn't really matter. The reality is if you're saved, it's because Jesus Christ intercepted you and you are born again and, he has, and you have availed yourself of the effectual working of his power through grace, through faith in Christ Jesus. And he says, unto me, who am less than the least of all saints. He says, man, I'm not even worthy to be called a saint. I'm not worthy to be set apart for God's use. Yet, he is. He says, is this grace given? I'm a murderer of Stephen. I am the one who murdered the man who was trying to bring the kingdom in. You get that, everybody? And now God has saved me and turned me into the very messenger that I was trying to kill. I'm not worthy of that grace. But yet, nonetheless, that's who God made me to be. Paul had that heavy on his conscience. Why? Because he knew the grace and the power and who he was in Christ was not something he earned. It was something that was bestowed upon him through the goodness of Almighty God. And beloved, that is the case for us today. And we think about making faithful men who are able to teach others also. Listen, listen, listen. Discipleship is not something you've got to work yourself up to do. Listen, discipleship is a privilege that God gives us to do that we could not possibly do in our flesh. It is not a set of intellectual exercises about doctrinal points that make us understand all these technical things about the Bible. It is the unfolding of God and who Christ is and the reality of the power that works in us as Christians so we can reproduce life to life to life for the glory of God Almighty until he comes for his church. 
And I don't know if you get this, but this church is directly through faith plugged in to the very people, to the very line, to the very faith of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And the power that, it, that was in the first century resides in us. This church and all the churches who believe this book, beloved, we're in the pipeline. We are the sons of God. We are the stewards of the mysteries. We are to be making disciples. Every bit is real. Every bit is real as the Apostle Paul and Timothy and Polycarp and whoever you want to name throughout all the other centuries. And if you can't see that, beloved, then rewind your mind and pick up and look at what we saw standing here last week and get involved in a real battle, a battle that changes the lives of people that we don't have any business preaching to because we aren't worthy. But God does it, and he loves our church. He loves you. Oh, I can't stress it enough. The gift of grace of God given to preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Oh, my. I got to quit. I mean, I'm telling you, that just does me in. You may think the next three decades will be the largest transfer of wealth in history because the baby boomers are going to leave their assets to the next generation. Well, guess what? You'd be wrong. The largest transfer of wealth is when God's people grab a hold of God's grace and distribute the unsearchable riches of Christ to a bankrupt world. That's the biggest wealth distribution. The problem is we got our eyes on the wrong economy. Do you understand the reason God allows a man who's born of the lowest caste of the Indian Hindu culture who was destined to be aborted, left on the street to live like a dog, was born again to travel to the richest country in the world, to to preach to some of the wealthiest people in the world, the unsearchable riches of Christ, because he's the wealthiest man in the room. And we miss it. We miss it because we're focused on the wrong things. You know why he's wealthy? (laughs) Because when he couldn't eat, he called out to his high priest. Somewhere along the way he got saved. And he called out to his high priest. When he's in the people's prison, and they're going to cut his legs, his arms, I'm sure his head as well, What did he do? Called out to his high priest. He says, help. I need more grace. I need more help. I need more resources. When the devil rose up to persecute the the poorest people, the poorest believers among us, some of them in the world, some impoverished saints, When the devil rose up to persecute them, didn't even make news in the richest nation of the world. Monetarily rich, that is. But there's an ambassador of Christ. There were several of them, not just one. I'm sure there were several hundreds, not thousands, crying out to God. And they cried out to God like the children of Israel in bondage. And you know what they said? Help, Lord. And a young man who believed the word of God got on a train. He says, I'm going to help. I'm going to do what I can. He's still trying to do what he can. He gets on a train, travels to Mumbai. It's crazy, guys. So we can figure out how rich we really are. Do you see how God works? I mean, the riches aren't always where you think they are. Because you've got to have eyes of faith. 
If you looked at Timothy in the first century and Paul, and you said, hey, join our team. Uh, we got false teachers in over the walls. They've come in. They're inside of us. They're not just outside. They're among us now. The churches in Asia, hey, they're gone. Uh, being strong in Christ means you're probably going to get in jail and maybe even die. Join our team. We're the winning guy. We're the winning team. You can only do that when you're strong in grace and you, ha- and you believe God's word. You know, a man who depends on God is going to find the resources to serve him. And God will provide. In Proverbs 3.27, the Bible says, Withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when it is in thine, uh, in thine hand to do it. Say not unto thy neighbor, Go and come again tomorrow, I'll give, when thou hast it by thee. If it's in your hand to do good, you do it. It was in Paul's, uh, or in Timothy's hand to do good. And Paul says, hey, Timothy, I know you're scared, but listen, buddy, don't be. You need, to, you need to avail yourself of the strength of God's grace, and you need to make sure you are busy about the discipleship of faithful men who are able to teach others also. Because one reason we've got to be strong in grace that is in Christ Jesus is because, well, we can be. You just can be. Why aren't we? Because we don't want to be. The other reason we must be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus is because we should be. We have a moral obligation to give the gospel to a bankrupt world. In, in Luke 12, 47, the Bible says, And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much... Of him they will ask the more. See, it's about stewardship. See, the greatest gift that God has given us is not our U.S. citizenship. And that's a pretty great gift. I didn't ask to be born here, but I'm so glad I am. Man, how about you, beloved? You glad to be born in the USA? Amen. If you're not, you're, it's, I don't, with all due respect, it's because you're stupid. I'm serious. You need to travel, you need to get out, and you need to realize... You're not, you're not nearly as pressed as you think you are, right? And so, um, man, this is the greatest place in the earth to live. And, and, and you can test me on it. And if I'm wrong, give me all the evidence, because I don't think you're going to find me wrong. It's, but, hey, listen, the greatest gift God has given to us isn't our grandparents or our parents' inheritance either. Because Uncle Sam's still going to get most of that anyway, Right? <laughs> So the greatest inheritance that God has given you is the gospel, this book, the word of God, the truths, the mysteries. It's when we understand his stewardship that we actively engage in making regular deposits of time in exchange for eternal riches in Christ. Oh, how blind the Laodicean church is. The doors are open and our cup runneth over, but we can't get past our convenience to make a withdrawal of grace. We expect the the world to turn to the government. We expect the rich to turn their wealth, turn to their wealth, but God brings us living epistles. And I'll tell you one reason why he does it, beloved, to remind us that we must turn to God. That's where our resources lie. And it's when we understand this stewardship that we begin to do three things. Number one, and it's in the text, we collect God's word from faithful men. We start to realize that this book, this thing that we do on Sunday, it's not just a ritual that we do on Sunday. Uh, The time we get together in the Word of God around here is precious. You take it for granted because you've always had it. Riley, is it precious what we do here? He says yes. Why? Because he's been looking for a church all last semester. He's in some good churches, don't get me wrong. But he's glad about what God's given us here. And I'm not saying that because I'm the pastor. I'm just, I'm just doing, there was a point in my discipleship process when I'm driving down I-35 and I realized that I'm not gonna outlive the pastors that were teaching me or that I'm not gonna outlive them, that they're not gonna outlive me. And there also happened to be a reality that you know what, the things that I'm being taught here, I'm a steward of and one of these days, I may give account for my generation. What if I'm the last man standing in my generation? Am I gonna be effective And this is before I was a pastor, guys. It's long before I was a pastor. And you know what that was? That was the call of God stirring in my heart, asking me if I was a faithful steward of the things that God had given me. 
because I went to a church where the word of God was being poured out and poured out and poured out. And praise God, I realized the most precious thing going on around that church is the word of God being poured out, being poured out. It wasn't the programs. It wasn't my friends, which I had a lot of good friends. It wasn't our buildings. We had a lot of big buildings and nice ball fields. No, that's all good and fine. What was really precious is this book. And so collect God's word from faithful men. You'll never be a teacher unless you're a student. You'll never make a withdrawal unless you make a deposit. And you'll never give it out if you don't take it in. There's a reason. This is one of the most widely quoted verses in a church like ours, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. We are a church which understands the essence of God's mission is to make, is, 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 uh, is to transfer grace and power through the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. The God of the universe chose that. We understand the Great Commission. We understand uh, that Jesus has all power. He wants us to go to all nations, and he wants us to make disciples of all men. We get that. We understand uh, that, that uh, the mysteries have been given to us through the Apostle Paul, that this dispensation is to be stewarded by us, and God has given those to us in this age of grace. We understand that we have the complete, perfect Word of God in our English language, and it, it coupled by faith, that the, the God who authors it grants us power and might in the inner man, power to know him, power of his resurrection, to love, to have a sound mind, and to share him wherever we go. We get that. And this church exists to equip the saints of God and the word of God to accomplish the mission of God and the power of God. And we do this for God's glory. It's the glory of God. And in short, we make disciples, just like Paul did with Timothy and just like Timothy did uh, with those that he was charged to disciple. Now, when you understand the unsearchable riches of God's grace and find in this book uh, those riches, you will spend time in mining its treasures, seeking God's truth, applying God's word to your heart. Proverbs says, my son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thy ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and lifteth up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find knowledge of God, for the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. So if you're here this morning and you're not involved some way in our discipleship ministry, you really aren't involved in the primary purpose of this church. And I don't mean that to be mean. It's just the truth. We are here to make disciples. And I know not everybody wants to do that, and that's fine, but we exist to make disciples. We, we offer information. We have formal processes called Discipleship 1, Discipleship 2, and HBI. But we want all men to be saved. We exist to equip all saints in the Word of God to accomplish His will and the power of God. So you're either a student or a teacher, and sometimes we're both. And often we both, <coughs> we are both. And Paul is calling us on a transfer of maturity. And that comes through discipleship, not just knowledge, but action. Jesus' disciples walked with him. They traveled with him. They observed him. They committed to others what he had given to them. And Paul was letting Timothy know that this time to collect from Paul was coming to a close. And now it was Timothy's time to commit the riches to other faithful men who would be able to be faithful in teaching others also. And you'll never give Beloved, this is the key, and I want you to hear me here. You'll never give what you don't receive. If you never take the principles from D1 and jump out by faith and use them, you'll never know what it was like. You got to hear them, you got to receive them, and then you got to do something with them. You got to move by faith. You'll never give what you don't receive. And before you commit your life to giving the word, you must commit your life to collecting the word. That's the way God does it. And you need to do that for men and women who are committed to teaching others also. Uh, how many of you this morning would just say that? I am committed to teaching others also. I bet many of you are. I bet several of you are. And some of you are trained uh, specifically for that. And you say, well, Brian, I don't like your discipleship process. Well, I don't care. When you're a pastor, then you can develop your own discipleship process. I'm really cool with that. You can. It's a free country, man. But just get some process and get people from point A to point B to point C to point D. <laughs> because that's what we do as a church. It's not a, it's not a, set of pro, it's not a program. It's not a set of lessons. It's not a set of classes. It's not, a, it's not just a path. Though there is a path and there are lessons and there are classes. Listen, beloved, that knowledge should, if we believe the word of God, it'll quicken us. And we will understand our stewardship that, you know what, this, isn't, this is true, 
Oh my goodness, the magnitude of the truth that we get in this church. It, the, the, the magnitude of the truth that we get in this church by itself should move the heart of someone who actually believes it. Are, are you guys getting what I'm laying down here? Or is the static from all the other noise drowning out the message of God's word? It's not a cunningly devised fable. This is God's word. And it is committed to those who hear it. But also, the second thing is we need to commit God's word to faithful men. One thing is that you got to, to give it, you got to get it. So you need to be committed to receiving it. Then you got to be committed <coughs> uh, to, to giving it to other faithful men. Our lives should be like a sponge. Commit God's word to faithful men. We suck up the word so we can be wrung out in ministry. And it's in ministry where the best discipleship takes place. When we lead a small group into battle with a target before us, there's a team behind us. There's one, there's two, there's three, there's four, there's five, there's 10, whatever people following. And beloved, that's when you're right in the sweet spot. And you know it takes God's grace and power to accomplish God's mission. And that's why as you're aiming for the target, you better be mindful of those people that are following. Because those are the people that God's called you to train and to minister to. Discipleship left the pages of our lessons. It left the classroom and it went into live action. Why? Because that's where God needs you. He needs you in a real battle. He needs you engaged in his mission somewhere, whether it's inside the walls of the church or it's out in the jail somewhere or over in a detention home or up in Monmouth on a trip or overseas somewhere or somewhere else. I don't know, but he needs you to be engaged as a faithful man or woman of God. And when we lead a small group into battle, discipleship's going to unfold. And it's there where the outward mission of getting the gospel where it needs to go occurs. While God does the inward work of transforming our lives into the image of Christ, that God does some amazing things. And our life should be like a cup. You're familiar with Psalm 23, 5, right? Where David writes and says, my cup runneth over. You know, he said that in the presence of his, his enemies. You know, if we were to give a situational report, at times it feels like, man, I'm surrounded by the enemy. He's in the interior. He's in the perimeter. We'll get to the soldiering part later. But the reality is simply this, beloved. <coughs> the, the situation is not so dire. Why? Because you are a man or a woman of faith. You can call upon the God of heaven and you can obtain all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And when you are in a time of need, you can say, God, help! And right in the midst of a mist of enemies, he will fill your cup to overflowing. And like Paul, you can say, hey, baby, bring it on, Nero. I'm ready for whatever you got because there's nothing you're going to do to stop me. And let me just be an example of the believers. You cannot kill my undying, unquenchable, unbelievable optimism. You just can't do it. Hey, oh, well, so bring the Syrians in and they invade my house. Okay, buddy, before you kill me, let me tell you about Jesus because I'll be coming back at the second coming to deal with you soon, seven years. I'll be back <laughs> after the rapture. So, uh, you know, the reality is you just don't lose as a Christian. There's just no losing. So why live like a loser? Why do so many Christians live like a loser when everything in the scripture says you're a winner? I'll tell you why, because you don't know what it is to be a son and you're struggling with what it is to be a steward. And so am I at times. Is your cup running over? If it's running over, but it's not overrunning with this, that's the problem. You need to replace what's feeding your, your cup with something that's eternal. If the word of God's not our priority, guys, that's our problem. Let's just face it. We're just kidding ourselves, playing church, going through all the motions taking pills to, to, you know, try to cover up our anxiety. The reality is if you want to have anxiety control, get a hold of the word of God and let your cup be flooded with promises and hope and optimism and eternity. You say, well, Brian, you believe all that stuff. I do, or I'd probably be a nutbag. I'd be out here with my AR. <laughs> here they come, you know. Hey, no, I'm out here with the word of God. Here he comes. He's already won the victory. The rest of this stuff is just semantics. And then the last thing is, I'm out of time, is we gotta commit this to faithful men who are able to teach others also. There's a handoff. In Psalms 12, 1, the Bible, that passage starts out by saying, help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. God forbid that we would take advantage of God's church to fill up our Bible margins 
our notebooks, our heads with information, but we forget to transfer our lives. God forbid that we resist the work of the Holy Ghost through our pride or stiff-necked nature to allow the Holy Ghost to transform us in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ so we can engage in real battles that are right before us. Hey, listen, it's not about getting men and women to attend church. Let's get everybody to attend church. Listen, beloved, we can, it's important that people come to church, don't get me wrong. But what we really need is people committed to the cause of Christ. When people are committed to the cause of Christ, church is part of the deal because they need to be trained. They need to be filled and they need to be sent. And people who get a hold of that, they get a hold of church because that's why God put it here. And, if a, and so many churches aren't doing that. And, and I'm one of these guys, that I'm like, I don't know what else to do. If it ain't working, I don't know what else to do. This is the only marching orders we have. We can ill afford to be committed collectors who are not serious about committed depositors. Let's not be lethargic. Let's not be fat. Let's have a good conscience. Let's be committed to the work of the gospel, making disciples, investing our lives in the life of others. And some of us here even, maybe we need to be careful because your children are going to grow up in this church and they're going to grow right past you. While you're looking at real battles to fight, I'm sorry, while they're looking for real battles to fight, you're not going to be there to take them on that mission trip. You're not really going to model what that looks like in your home. And they'll never see you do anything that resembles hearing, reading, and believing this holy book. Because all you want to do is attend. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know who I'm talking to. But I'll tell you what, there's a lot of great examples. There's a lot of great depositors in this church. This church, it, it could be that God is calling you out of your comfort so that you can be who God saved you to be. Because if you're not faithful, you're foolish. You're foolish to sit here and collect riches upon riches and riches upon riches and not do a darn thing about it. Some of us don't need to be filled up. But frankly, we need to be stirred up. And that's why Paul wrote that in chapter one. When I see a man like Carl Hatfield get, in his, get his walker, right, and make his way down to the mighty warrior's room so he can minister to our kids, I say, that's a good deposit right there. That's a great investment. That's a man who's doing what we've been talking about. The fact that he can, he can hardly get there, man, praise God for him. What an example of the believers. We're rich, beloved, we're rich. God doesn't want us to flatter with our lips, but to preach the word of God. He wants our lives to be about commitment to the truth. So commit to reproducing faithful men who reproduce faithful men. Pray strategically and passionately. Collect God's word faithfully. Listen for what God is saying. Deploy it regularly. Deposit it frequently. And you know what? You will see fruit eternally if you're fearlessly faithful. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, as we